Hey, DCF, Pastor Brad here. Hope you had a great weekend and are having a great start to another week. As we come together on these Monday mornings or at any point during the week, whenever you can get to this video, and encourage one another to pursue Christ together. That's the, the title of these videos that come out each and every week because we want to be a people who don't simply attend church. We want to be a people who gather to worship in a special way on Sunday that propels us out into a week as we worship God throughout the week and as we recognize that Jesus has sent his soul, Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives, as we mentioned yesterday during the sermon, that he's always with us, that we have a continual relationship, that we're in union with Christ all throughout our days, our weeks, and therefore should be pursuing time with him. Any relationship that develops and is strong requires us spending time with the people we're in relationship with. And so that looks like spending time in the Word of God, as that is the place that God speaks to us. Uh, it, it means spending time in prayer, as that is the opportunity that we have to speak back to God. It means being a part of smaller groups and connecting to one another in deep and costly fellowship, because we grow best when we grow together, as God's vision for His people is to form us together into a family, into a body, into the church. And so... Um, we want to pursue Christ together, obviously, when we are together, but also on our own throughout the week, um, each and every day. And uh, so every week I come together, or I, I come to these videos with some sort of encouragement for you as you do that during your week. And this week, and I couldn't remember if I did this, if I mentioned this earlier this year, so if I did, forgive me, but it's never a, a bad thought to have as a reminder. And that would be this, that uh, during the course of the week, you have people who share things with you. Um, you have good friends or family members who share things that are sad, that are that are um, causing concern, anxiety, that are uncertain. Uh, you've got friends that let you know at school if you're a teen that you know they got a test coming up or something stressful at home. You've even got people who, in the course of uh, the ordinary events of your life that you're interacting with that you don't know all that well, they might share something with you. A, a cashier, um, a cashier at a uh, at a grocery store, or a barber at a at a um, at a barber <laughs> where when you're getting your your haircut, who just in the course of conversation might share something with you. I, I remember I had developed this relationship with. One of the cashiers at Kroger, when I used to do uh, primarily all the grocery shopping for our family, I don't do that anymore, um, so I don't see her as much. But I would see her all the time, and I remember she was she was probably in her late fifties, and um, her husband had come down with uh, with cancer, and she knew just through the course of conversation that I was the youth pastor at the time at the church, and so um, she asked me to pray for it. And this is what I was going to share is to encourage you in the course of those conversations to be bold and to ask the person, would it be okay if I prayed for you right now? Who's going to say no to that? <laughs> Most people, even if they're not overly religious, even if they don't have a relationship with God, even if they're not sure that it would do anything, um, most people was, would, would value you taking a step and offering to pray for them in that moment. And what a powerful testimony that is to, to people that we, we can say to them through our actions. We believe that God hears our prayers, that God wants us to come to him and pray, that God is concerned about the details of our lives. He cares about your husband that has cancer. He cares about uh, your daughter who's sick and in the hospital. He cares about the tests that you have coming up tomorrow. He cares about the, the strained relationships you have with your friends. And you know what? I, I'm going to bring those to God right now in prayer and ask him to bless them. So, um... So uh, I know Deb's going to watch this on Monday. She just brought me some cookies, and so I'm just giving her a shout-out uh, for those cookies. Thank you, Deb. Um, and she'll see this on Monday when she watches the video. Um, so anyway, an encouragement to you to be praying for people. To Don't just say you're going to pray for them, but do it. Pray for them in the course of the week. Pray for them right there on the spot. Okay, I'm coming to you today with Article 16 of the Belgic Confession. The title, The Doctrine of Election. Um, this is probably one of the most controversial doctrines of the church. It's one that divides churches between Arminian free will churches 
and Calvinistic Reformed slash Presbyterian churches. Um, it's one that people get passionate about. It's one that probably everybody at some level has wrestled through. Uh, and some people have come to a, a solid footing on it, and others probably still haven't. And they're still, they're still not sure. There's, and there's different reasons why it would cause kind of consternation in your soul. As it comes to the doctrine of election, um, also referred to as predestination, I want to encourage you, as I encourage everybody when I talk about this doctrine and when we discuss uh, the implications of predestination versus um, free will, and I'll, ex I'll explain uh, the necessary distinction you have to make between uh, what we would still hold to as free will, uh, even as we affirm predestination, and what Arminian free will folks believe. Um, and that, that just completely threw me off of my train of thought. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what I always tell people when we talk about this topic is do everything you can to try to ask the question, what does Scripture say about election? What does Scripture say about predestination? We all kind of have our bents. We all kind of have big questions. And not every big question has a totally satisfactory answer. But the question isn't, what do I want to be true? What makes sense to me? How can I put the pieces together in my mind so I can kind of sleep good at night and wrap my mind around this complicated, difficult topic? The question is, what does the Bible say? This is one of the things that I hope you are picking up from my ministry with you over the first two and a half years, is what Scripture says God says. What we want to know about this is, what does God say? For God is truth, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if we're going to know what God says, we have to know what Scripture says. And the rest of it honestly doesn't matter doesn't matter what I want to be true. doesn't matter what I think is true. It matters what God says is true in his word. That's true of so many topics, right? So many cultural topics, the big ones that are controversial today. Again, you can do the same thing with that topic uh, or, or any of those topics. What does the Bible say? That's what matters. Okay, um, that's a really long preamble. The doctrine of election, here's what it says. We believe that, and this is the absolute necessity, ne necessary place to start. All Adam's descendants, having thus fallen into perdition and ruin, separated from God, total depravity, original sin, that's what we talked about last week, by the sin of the first man, Adam, God showed himself to be as he is, merciful and just. Those are two of the divine attributes. God is merciful, but God is also just. We know that he is those two things at the same time, neither, never in contradiction to one another. Um, that's what we see at the cross, as God was merciful towards those who would put their faith in Jesus, but just in pouring out his wrath upon his son for those who would, ex who would receive the mercy. God doesn't just get rid of the offense. No, it was paid for. It was just paid for, paid for by another. Okay, so God is merciful and just towards those who have fallen into perdition, and ruin, whose lives have been completely uh, marked by total depravity because of original sin passed down to us from Adam and also our own sin. That's the necessary place to start. The, the reality of that, and this is why we spent the last two weeks kind of building this case, is because nobody, nobody apart from the work of God desires to come to God. Right? Our hearts are dead in sin and trespass. And if that's the case, then how is it that we would ever come to faith in Christ? The answer is God must elect us. He must move in our lives first by the work of his Holy Spirit. We call that regeneration so that we can respond with faith. Okay, And that's the doctrine of election. God elects those whom he, in his mercy, has chosen to shine the light of the gospel into. It's not that there are any people who would desire to come to God that God says no. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's often one of the struggles, right? Well, like, 
What if someone wants to come to God? The only reason they would want to come to God is because God has awoken or woken up their heart to the reality of their sin and their need for Christ. Apart from that, they're able to act in accordance with their will. They have a free will, which is to act in accordance with it. The problem is their will is totally depraved. It's dead. That's what Ephesians 2 says. Let me just read this for you. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. He's talking to people who are alive in Christ now, the church. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Go read all of Ephesians 2. Actually, go back and read all of Ephesians 1. It's even more clear in that, that God chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. He had to. Apart from that, you would not love or desire Christ. Here's the way that the Belgian Confession says it. He is merciful in withdrawing and saving from this perdition those whom he in his eternal and unchangeable counsel, has elected and chosen in Jesus Christ our Lord by his pure goodness without any consideration of their works. And friends, I don't know about you, but when I first came to have my eyes opened to the beauty of the doctrine of election, it is the first time when my heart felt secure. On the one hand, it was like, all of a sudden, the second verse of Amazing Grace made sense to me. Um, Twas grace, right? The doctrines of grace that God chose us. Twas grace that caused my heart to fear. Why would grace make my heart fear? Well, because all of a sudden I think, I'm not in control. Somebody else is in control. And for those of us who like to be in control, that's kind of scary. And, and so... I need something else. So grace that taught my heart to fear and grace, my fears relieved. All of a sudden, the light bulb goes on and you realize, oh, it's out of sight of my control, but it's in God's control. And I love Christ and I recognize my sin and my need for him. That means he's opened my eyes to understand the gospel and I'm trusting in it. And if that is true, then God has saved me. God has elected me. And now my feet are standing on so much more solid ground than they ever were when I thought it was about me raising a hand, signing a card, walking an aisle, praying a prayer that some person from a stage led me in. No, it is God's grace that reached down and caused my dead heart to come alive and respond with faith now that I can see the beauty of Christ and all that he offers in the gospel. It is the work of God to save us. And, and, and the, the doctrine of election, Article 16, wraps up by saying, so that's the mercy of God. He is also just in leaving the others in ruin and fall into which they plunge themselves. Again, God did not cause them to go into that place. Human beings, by their free will, chose to sin in Adam and every, day, every single day since and saw our relationship with God broken, shattered, so that our souls are dead. And it's not that God caused us to be there, but he simply left those in perdition who he, by his eternal counsel, has chosen. Romans, that's a, and that's part of the difficulty, right? And, and we just recognize it's not, there are difficult questions that have to be answered and thought through. Romans 9 is one of the clearest places where Paul walks through some of those difficult questions and helping us to see um, how it is that God uh, reveals to the object of his mercy, um, uh, his mercy because of what happens to the objects of, of his wrath. But part of the point is we don't know. And so we're called to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Just like we told we were said yesterday, uh, it's not our job to build the church. Jesus builds the church. We need to make disciples. 
It's not our job to know whom God has elected and whom he hasn't. It's our job to make disciples. But when someone's heart is awoken to the gospel, we can be assured that it is God that has done that work. And therefore, what God has started, he will carry out to completion. You cannot lose your salvation because it is about what God has done in you to claim you for himself. Sorry that was long. Uh, hope it was helpful. I'm sure it raises lots of questions. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11, all great places to go through to. Lots of Galatian passages as well. And Ephesians, let me look up, or sorry, Ephesians, Exodus. Let me just read this for you. Sorry. Deuteronomy 7, 6. He says this to Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Once you see the doctrine of election clearly, you'll now see it in every place in the scripture. It's everywhere if your eyes are open to see it. Have a great week loving and serving your king, and I'll see you on Sunday.